Welcome, my name is Dr. Stephen Sennett. I'm an American osteopathic physician, and I'd like to talk to you today about Dr. Johnston's functional technique for the spine. To begin with, I've selected a quote here from Dr. William L. Johnston's original publication of Functional Orientation for Technique, <clears throat> where he is describing um, what he felt was a new uh, viewpoint on osteopathy. Uh, in quotes here, the general considerations to be taken into account in a physiologically oriented approach to the problem of understanding and handling the lesion musculoskeletal segment revolve about the newer concepts of organization in complex living entities like the body. More and more, it appears that this organization is made up of a multiple series of continually acting reciprocal transactions among all body parts and all body systems. This notion of the transactual nature of living organization supersedes the older straight line cause and effect sequence, which were once thought to contain the scientific secrets of all living. So Dr. Johnson is trying to set the stage for us as a, uh, to differentiate from how uh, things were being looked upon as just a static view of a single segment um, dysfunction and looking at things in a dynamic, uh, more complex motor unit. So how did it develop? Well, the roots of Dr. Johnson's work can be traced back to Dr. Still. Many people will trace things back to Dr. Still, although Dr. Still rarely taught technique. People that observed him with patients noted that he did things that were um, high velocity types of techniques. He did things that were soft and slower palpation. He did repositioning uh, to the path of least resistance. He did many different things. And many people have laid claims on these exact type of techniques. So this is, there are references in Dr. Still's writings of soft techniques, whether it was actually functional technique or functional technique developed from these ideas, difficult to tell. Some names that Dr. Johnston gives credit to uh, for coming up with functional technique would be from Dr. Still, Edith Ashmore, Carl McConnell, Carter Downing, uh, Howard Lippincott, Dr. Hoover, Dr. Bowles, and Lawrence Jones. And these people were not working necessarily the same, but they're all leading to what Dr. Johnson developed as functional technique. <clears throat> uh, the main ideas for functional technique is that Dr. Johnson looked at motor function as opposed to a static finding. The assessment is patient passive, which is nice if you have a patient who's not able to cooperate and follow uh, your instructions. It is an indirect type of treatment. We're taking things away from the lesioned area into the position of ease. He was unique in his view of the three segment complex. He also talked about uh, a mirror image and linkage. And these are concepts that only Dr. Johnston talked about. They're not in our traditional osteopathic nomenclature. So I'm going to do my um, best attempt here to explain what it was he was explaining so we can understand his thought process. So. He didn't look at, in this drawing, for example, he didn't look at C3 as necessarily the problem. He looked at the complex of C3, C2, and C4, and that they had to meet a certain criteria for Dr. Johnston to call it a three-segment complex. In this case, he's looking at a restriction in C3, and he's looking at opposite restrictions in C2 and C4. And the combined uh, dysfunction would be the three-segment complex. And this is a scan from his original work. So uh, to be clear, as we start this, these, this type of nomenclature is not used in modern uh, osteopathy uh, today, but these are the original drawings from Dr. Johnston. So here, what we have is we have a three segment complex. In this diagram, he's showing the segments above and below C2 and C4 have opposite palpatory findings to that of C3. And he describes those opposite findings as mirror images or that they are compensatory or secondary to the dysfunction of C3. We can relate that to a side bending restriction or a rotation restriction. And that is what Dr. Johnson 
um, is noting here a restriction to either side bending or rotation or rotation in C3, and it has the opposite effect above and below. Dr. Johnson further theorizes that the changes at C2 and C4 are believed to be due to somatosomatic reflexes from the dysfunction at C3. Again, he calls them mirror images, C2 and C4. This is another diagram from Dr. Johnson's original work. This is what he calls a three segment complex without linkage. Again, that term linkage is something specific to functional technique in Dr. Johnston's work. What he's showing here is he's showing a primary costal dysfunction at left rib seven that's resisting inhalation and shoulder rotation to the right. <clears throat> There are secondary asymmetries that are noted at the left ribs six and seven. They are mirror images above and below. There's an opposing vertebral asymmetry at T6, seven, and eight. According to functional theory, this rep represents a horizontal adaptation to the left lateral costal dysfunction at rib seven. The diagram indicates palpatory findings uh, the, with the arrows here showing a resistance to either rotation or to side bending. They are mirrored above and below, mirrored above and below. He says that these are not linked. There's no linkage between what's going on in the vertebra and what's going on in, in the costal area, except as a, um, a secondary adaptation. This is Dr. Johnson explaining what he calls a three-segment complex with linkage. In this diagram, he shows a primary vertebral dysfunction at T11 and right rib 11. Because T11 and rib 11 have the same restrictions. Again, those restrictions can be rotation or side bending because the restrictions are the same. He's saying that this vertebral segment and this rib, they are not mirror images, they are linked. And again, that Nomenclature is used only by Dr. Johnston in describing his functional theory. According to functional theory, asymmetries at T10, T12, ribs 10, and rib 12 are compensatory and secondary to the primary dysfunctions at segment T11 and rib 11. Dr. Johnston further theorizes that linkage is the result of an underlying viscerosomatic reflex with the compensatory rib and vertebral findings acting as compensatory somatosomatic reflexes. It gets quite complicated, his theories. I would um, ask you to understand this is his thought process that we're trying to understand. I'm not necessarily saying that I agree with it or disagree with it, but these were his findings. So putting it all together is actually much easier than the theory that Dr. Johnson gives us. Uh, we make a diagnosis, we palpate the area to be treated, we position the patient while monitoring the primary area during the entire process, and we find a position that allows normalization of the dysfunction, and then we reposition them to neutral and reassess our findings. That's a very simple way of stating it. Um, in, Dr. in Dr. Johnson's uh, only textbook that he made on this, these are exactly his words. It's kind of complicated, I'm going to go through it, and then I'm going to make it simpler at the end. So Dr. Johnston asks us to introduce one plane of motion. Uh, it's very minimal forces. The motions are directed towards a sense of immediate increasing ease, meaning that we are moving things to the position of ease. Remember, this is an indirect technique, which means we're moving to the position of ease. He describes that response as manifested by decreasing sense of resistance to pressured fingers monitoring response at the tense dysfunctional segment. That's kind of scientific textbook speak for saying move to the position where things are easier. Single elements of rotor, uh, rotary and translatory directions are combined. So you're gonna find these positions of ease and stack them together. Um, affecting a control of a smooth torsion arc for the body movement. The order in which you do these, rotation, side bending, forward, backward bending, is not important. The final step, once you've stacked all the directions together, uh, involves asking the patient for active respiration. Whichever one makes the segment motion easier. The breath is to be slow and briefly held. 
uh, the respiratory interval, adding to the continuous feedback of decreasing resistance allows the operator to actively finalize the combination of translator and rotary elements most appropriate to reach the objective of a sense of release of tissue tension at fingertips, monitoring the dysfunctional segment. Really complicated paragraph, I know, but these are, I want to give you the original words from Dr. Johnson. And that is the respiratory interval, the breath in or breath out that they're holding should culminate in decreased tension at the segment. Um, finally, the release of restraint in the motor mechanism allows the return to midline resting unobstructed by any sense of resistance previously encountered in the return direction. Those are his instructions for us. So to look at it simply, motion in three, di in three dimensions. We live in three dimensions, so we can take each axis and what we're used to doing normally is doing rotation about an axis. What Dr. Johnston is having us do is rotation about an axis, pick any particular axis and rotate around for the position of ease. And then he's also gonna count this as a separate direction, very small movement of translation along that axis. What will it look like in actual practice? It'll look like this. So we can take a dysfunctional segment which I've just made arbitrarily right here, and say, if we side bend it to the left, side bend it to the right, where is that middle spot? It is the middle spot in that range of motion. It's not the middle neutral position between normal side bending left and side bending right. It's the middle spot of that available range of motion, which differentiates this from counter strain. Counter strain will go to the extreme position of ease. That's a very slight, uh, very slight deviation difference from Dr. Jones's work. Uh, so this is um, side bending along a, a, an AP axis. This is translation along an AP axis. So how are we going to do that? Well, this is very mild side bending of the neck. This is merely lifting the segment up if they're in a prone position or if they're in a supine position, excuse me, lifting it up or dropping it down. These are very small movements. Movement in a transverse plane. In a transverse, uh, transverse axis, I'm sorry, transverse axis moving in a sagittal plane, we can do flexion extension. Again, it's very small movement. We can do horizontal translation along a transverse axis. And you're adding each one of these directions to the direction before. The order in which you do it is not important. A vertical axis, we can add a little bit of rotation. And I would say do this last because it's a little difficult to maintain. Mild compression or mild distraction. And again, for each of these directions, you are taking the middle spot in that motion, not the end extreme range of motion as you would in counter strain or facilitate positional release. So some, some examples here, I'm trying to demonstrate in this example, anterior translation. It would be just a very small amount of pressure up or releasing the pressure. Where is the middle spot? Um, here I'm just showing you a vertical translation and rotation. This is not, you're not doing a Sperling's test here. You're not putting kg of pressure on the head. It's the very mildest pressure. Rotation can be done with two fingers, rotating the segment to the left or to the right. Another word that has been used in this type of technique has been called stacking by others. Um, you're trying to get as many of these directions, the middle spot, as many as you can. It's not necessary to get them all or to feel confident that you got all of these directions. If you can get a few of them and then ask the patient to breathe in or breathe out, you may get some reduction of the tension of the segment. You can apply the same, uh, the same idea to the thorax, the lumbar spine, from seated position, standing, or supine. Some, difficult, some positions are a little difficult to get some of the translatory motions. So again, I'll go back to my earlier comment. I get as many motions as possible. Um, ask them to breathe in, hold the breath briefly. Ask them to breathe out, hold the breath briefly, and see which one of those uh, eases the soft tissue tension. The way I find this application to be uh, very useful is combining it with other types of techniques. You might combine this with myofascial technique 
or you may deviate from doing a facilitated positional release or counter strain technique and the combination works um, quite well. I hope you found this lecture useful. Uh, if you've enjoyed this lecture, please, uh, please subscribe to our channel and please pass the information on to your colleagues. Thank you for your attention.